Good afternoon, and welcome to the latest talk in our focus on SOG Treasures and Collection series with Elsa Churchill, who is the genealogist at the Society of Genealogists. Over to you, Elsa. Thank you. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Today, I'm going to be giving a sort of half hour presentation on, in, as part of the focus. We're starting to look at marriage records at the Society of Genealogists, and I'm particularly looking in this session on marriage indexes and marriage settlements. Um, as you can imagine, both are quite well represented within our collections. I'll be f speaking in more general terms about marriage indexes and actually focusing quite a lot on marriage settlements as they're more of original documents held within our collections. But I think some people might be quite surprised that the society holds. Um, these all fall within the realms of the particular focus of what society collects, dealing with um, sources relating to the places where your ancestors lived, um, including the recording of um, baptisms, burials and marriages. And of course, we look at uh, records relating to marriage, uh, such as marriage licenses and or marriage settlements and on documents. Uh, also, we have uh, material relating to what your ancestors did in their lives and uh, Re looking also at what research has been done on your family before. So these are the main focuses of what the society collects. And in addition to transcripts, indexes, finding aids, secondary sources, we also uh, uh, end up as an archive of original documents for um, all sorts of reasons, as I'll explain later on. So let's have a, just an idea about the concept of the marriage index, because we live in a world now where we, we kind of expect, um, particularly church registers recording baptisms, marriages and burials, which are held in local record offices, to be available in a digital form, having been transcribed and indexed um, online through the major genealogy um, websites, often with an image of the original uh, uh, record so that you can, can check that, that that you've got the right entry and if there's any more um, clues within the record itself that doesn't fit into the little of particular fields and boxes of transcriptions and indexes in databases. A lot of the um, transcription and creating of indexes to records, particularly marriages, came from what we would now almost call crowdsourcing projects from the genealogical community itself. Often a local family history society would have teams of volunteers looking at the at the records, maybe at the record working as a project at the record office. And the first um, of the sort of crowdsourcing projects to index records, uh, which should really come into, into the fore, I think, from the um, late 80s through the 90s and the early 2000s, um, was to look at records uh, which in, rec recorded the marriages of people from marriage registers, the bride and the groom, hopefully the witnesses, um, and indeed to act as a finding aid for an event that might have taken place in in either the groom's parish or the bride's parish or indeed elsewhere if they've had a special license um, but again it was an idea of just leading you to find the documentation and as the years went on pretty much every county ended up with a marriage index um, often uh, published by that society first in perhaps uh, transcripts or typescripts that they might give a copy to the record office where they'd worked, so often to the Family History Society and maybe a local library, for example. And the idea being was that they were very contained, often within the county that the Family History Society um, represented, and they would work their way through the registers, often reflecting the, um, the way that the registers themselves were, were arranged. So you might find they would record first all the registers in the uh, uh, marriages are recorded in the registers from, for example, 1812 to 1837. Uh, the, or the registers in the printed uh, uh, formats uh, from uh, the 
the way that the, the registers were arranged, uh, then you'd have perhaps uh, a break from period before 1812 going back to 1754. Registers, marriage registers would be in a slightly different format, perhaps. And then uh, from the earliest years, from possibly from the introduction to uh, uh, of parish registers from 1538 going up to 1753, where the introduction of Hardwick's Marriage Act had changed what marriage registers look like. And so often the mar a county marriage index might, might be uh, running through the whole period from uh, uh, 1538 through to 1837, um, or in these sort of defined yearly chunks. And they might publish them over a period of years, um, and in different formats, as I said, they might come in a uh, in typescripts. Uh, then they might think use the next WYSI technology, which might be a microfiche um, or the or microfilm of just to save space. And then they might have used uh, electronic or digital form, perhaps publishing the database on a CD, and then ultimately publishing maybe that own database themselves on their own website or perhaps working then in collaboration with some of the major genealogy websites to donate that index uh, to help people working online. So as that time goes on, often they very generously donated a copy to the Society of Genealogists. And the main sort of indication of what marriage indexes have been compiled by local family history societies and or individuals who perhaps might have done it as a labour of love rather than working um, as a group project was always kept up to date by um, a, an appropriate Gibson guide. Um, and the last edition that came out was Marriage Indexes for Family Historians uh, by Jeremy Gibson and co. Um, came out some years ago in, in 2008, by which time most societies had sort of almost finished their, finished their projects and were starting to publish online, making them much more easily accessible. And so, but, uh, but again, this is the guide to say uh, what there is. It was arranged county by county, um, explaining you know, what, how the, what the society had worked, uh, perhaps sometimes telling you what they'd used, whether it had been from local parish registers or whether they had used uh, bishop's transcripts as supplementary records, etc. And as they were published, the Society of Genealogists either gave them through donation or always went out of their way to buy each of these publications. And so you can use the Society's catalogue to identify what marriage indexes we have in the library. It'll tell you what format it's in. Um, most of them are not ours to publish. They, re they retained the copy, but through the copyright of, the, of that local family history society, um, who tended to have, who make, if they did make a partnership to publish it with somebody else, tended to go perhaps with Ancestry or Find My Past, for example. But they were um, incredibly and were and are incredibly useful uh, tools. And often, having completed the marriage index, the local society may have gone on to complete an index of all the entries of uh, baptisms in the parish registers and then all the entries of burials in the parish registers but it tends to be the marriage the marriage um index that was the most um important and it tended to be the crowd project uh, uh that the crowd sourcing project that these volunteers worked on after they completed their census indexes and indeed, the, this guide used to be marriage and census indexes for family historians before they decided, right, we'll separate the two out. Uh, censuses had really, really, by that, by, by that time, largely been published online. And so they retained the marriage index guide. Um, so but the idea, of course, is that how you can use these marriage index in, in indexes. They would include uh, uh, as an alphabetical arrangement of every of every entry. Um, in the parish, you could perhaps extract all the entries for a name um, to, to use them for family reconstructions, to map where, where marriages had taken place. They had a very broad, broad coverage. They might help perhaps you localise places where the, the name might be prevalent in various, in various parishes. Um, again, uh, useful for all sorts of, of, of resources. Often these marriage indexes um, came about perhaps because I think the Society of Genealogists was 
was at a forefront in the pre-internet age of, of creating the finding aid for marriages, particularly under the leadership of Percival Boyd, as shown there on the right. Um, he was an indefatigable indexer of records. Um, he said he, he started collating and indexing marriages because he thought that they were very difficult to find. And in his diffident way, he suggested that was because often a young man was too shy to ask a girl from his own parish to marry. And so he probably traveled further afield to marry another girl. And of course, added to the, to the convention of marrying in a bride's parish, he decided that perhaps marriages were, were more difficult to find as people traveled around. I think his reasoning probably says more about his own personality. Um, but again, I thought that was a lovely reason why he compiled an, a, rem a remarkable um, finding aid. You see all those volumes there done literally with manual typewriters in the 30s and 40s and 50s until he died in 1955. And he um, bequeathed his index to the society, but also shared some of some of his collection with uh, the Genealogical Society of Utah, or what's become Family Search. And so, his uh, collection uh, was originally lots and lots and lots of uh, volumes uh, arranged in effectively three series. There were his first series of divided into counties, so there'd be a county for Cambridge, Essex, Gloucestershire, etc., as you can see on the left-hand side. And then as he, th those got bound up, and then he uh, had extra, uh, further entries that he found, and so he created what was called a, the first miscellaneous series. Um, then there became the third miscellaneous series, that was typed up after his death from the slips that he had done in the old days of, of creating an index. He'd literally extract information on paper slips, sort the paper slips into alphabetical order, and then type the slips up. Um, this is what the old books used to look like, and they have been now uh, extracted into a digital form as a database on the SOG uh, website. Uh, through our digital collections and with in partnership with Find My Past. Uh, but as you can see, it isn't always clear exactly what's co what's covered. From the left-hand Essex volumes, it's we're, we're presuming it's from the parish registers, but occasionally he's made a note saying it's taken from the band's register. And on, on the right hand, from the mis one of the miscellaneous series, um, you see some very interesting comments like BUP London or Sudbury ML or Lancaster ML, which to me suggests that he'd used not parish registers for that entry, but had taken them from the published uh, marriage licenses, uh, indexed and published from marriage licenses from the various diocesan and archdeaconry courts that issued marriage licenses at that time. And my interestingly, I'm looking to see, well, what does Canterbury mean? There are 16 parishes in Canterbury, and he hasn't indicated which of the particular parishes within Canterbury. I, it, but does it mean ca he might have used Canterbury Parish registers or bishops' transcripts, perhaps? Or is, it, is he perhaps taking it from the printed marriage license indexes from the Diocese of Canterbury in East Kent? Or is it something to do with licenses issued by the Archbishop of Canterbury? It's not clear. And I do spend quite a bit of my time when people have found one of these entries on an online database, um, actually helping them to interpret perhaps, you know, why, what, 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 where is this entry taking place? Um, which parish in Canterbury, for example? And um, it's not always clear exactly um, what, what, there is, what, it, what it is it's been taken from. We do have a TypeScript guide to all the parishes which are supposed to be covered by the various um, uh, county volumes and miscellaneous volumes, and indeed our cat our library catalogue does try and give you an indication if a particular parish is covered in Boyd's marriage index. After his death, the remaining slips were typed up by Family Search, and so the the third series of 
bound volumes came back to the society but there is a bit of an ambiguity about ownership of that volume and so we have only published the um, first and second miscellaneous series not the third series um, because family search were involved as his um, after after his death you will find uh, that there are uh, parts of Boyd's marriage index including the third miscellaneous series on family search so again Boyd's Marriage Index is at the Society of Genealogists, but it has, over the years, it's had its slight complications. Well, it eventually became indexed on SOG Data Online and on Find My Past. And as we are now moving towards a new platform to um, add our uh, uh, digital data on called SOG Explore, Boyd's, the entries from Boyd's Marriage Index, which are on SOG Data Online, have been have migrated over to um, SOG Data Explore. Another index which uh, came to us in um, if essentially is from the old-fashioned paper slips created um, by Michael Gandhi, indexing marriages for the whole of the county of Kent from 1813 to 1837 and from the east, eastern part of the county of Kent from 1754 to 1812, we typed up, created a database, we put that on SOG Data Online, and then have migrated that over to SOG Explore. So those are essentially some of the indexes owned or created by the society, but many, many more are, of course, in the uh, various other formats at, in the books, fish, film, um, databases, CDs at the SOG. Um, as I say, here are entry for Boyd's Marriage Index on SOG Data Explore. Boyd's Marriage Index was probably the first and largest marriage index to be created. That was um, the uh, uh, about 7 million names, possibly prior to the digitization of records, the next largest index was actually created by a firm of what we would now recognize as air hunters or uh, chancery agents, as they tended to be called at that time, effectively a professional per per uh, team of, gene of genealogical researchers who created what was known as the Palo Marriage Index. Again, these were uh, old fashioned slips extracted from uh, parish registers and or transcribed registers, notably those uh, marriage registers edited and, trend and published by, uh, the, by Fillimore and Co. And, and this became an alphabetical slip index of marriages in the, Lon in the London area and the uh, other counties with effectively lots of published parish registers. Um, and these slips held formally by the Institute of Heraldic and Genealogical Studies in Canterbury, um, again with a good, probably about a million or so slips, uh, were, were uh, licensed to be used by Ancestry and have been incorporated into the uh, entries from registers uh, that you will find on Ancestry. And when they only, when you, if you look at the original register, if you look at the orig original image associated with the index entry, you do find you're not looking at a parish register entry, you're looking at the slips created by the PALO, P A L L O T, PALO's marriage index. Commercial companies um, like Ancestry and Find My Past have certainly carried on to work with local family history societies, often uh, licensing the use of their indexes to um, uh, when they have come to an arrangement, perhaps with the local family, local record society to create uh, images and databases from the records here. Oxfordshire Family History Society seems to have licensed its uh, marriage index, and it was certainly a very, a very extensive marriage index, has licensed its work on uh, to uh, to Ancestry to enable, you know, to assist them in part of the uh, indexing process. 
you'll very likely use lots of websites together to find an entry. Um, each commercial website may have transcribed and indexed a record uh, differently. So the society is licensed by my past to use parts of the, of SO, of the SOG's Boyd's Marriage Index. Um, and as you can see there, there's an entry for um, Mary Tritton. Um, whereas Ancestry, interestingly, had, that entry is also within the Palos Marriage Index on Ancestry. That has that down as Mary Fritton. Um, they got, both seem to be quite have got the, been consistent with the the groom's name. Though one spells it P O I N T E R as pointer, and one spells it P O Y N T E R. And you'll just have to look at the original to see. Uh, that was pretty much like a Y to me. Of uh, uh, whether that's Mary Tritton or Fritton with the bar going across, F's and T's being very easy to. Um, to uh, misinterpret. So using the county marriage indexes and Boyd's marriage index and Palo marriage index is very much of what I use as a sort of marriage search strategy for when I'm trying to look for a marriage. Obviously, if you're, if you're looking for a marriage, you might want to, to look at uh, initially to see if the marriage took place in the same parish where the child was baptised. Uh, perhaps broaden your, your search, particularly if you do know where the uh, where the mother or the father came from and they'd use the parish registers of those appropriate parishes, perhaps look in the immediate neighbouring parishes and then cast your net wider by looking at digital records that hopefully that cover um, as much of the counties uh, or even broader areas as you can through family search, the commercial um, genealogy websites, often of which incorporate now some of the county marriage indexes and some of the first immediate ones. So again, this is where I think the marriage index that we have and stands within the sort of society's uh, use and ideas of one of the things that will help you find a marriage. But I'd like to talk about some in unusual records as part of the marriage process that I think are underused. Um, and those are the marriage settlements. Now, the reason they're underused is there's no one place where you would find them. Often they remain within family papers and, and do not survive and may not be appropriate for, people, for all types of persons in society. One thing, the, the thought might be that upper, upper and middle class families, in those families, financial provision might be made for a woman, um, perhaps thinking about what would happen after the death of her husband and perhaps this provision might be that her father would provide land or money at the time of the marriage which would be held in trust and its future was specified in a legal document known as a marriage settlement um, making provision for the, the wife coming in to the family. Unmarried women and widows could often own both real and personal property and make wills, but the situation was quite different for married women. Um, they did, they did on marriage, a, a woman's property was transferred to the ownership of her husband, and she was una unable to make a will without his consent. However, a married woman could receive and inherit property if it was specified as being for her own personal use in legal documents, such as wills, prenuptial arrangements, and marriage settlements. Marriage settlements were often drawn up in advance of marriages between people from the middle and upper classes, as they almost always concern the conveyance of land. Marriage settlements are often found in, pub in bundles of deeds, and it may be possible to identify them in archive catalogues when relevant collections have been catalogued down to item level or indeed names. Although they don't include details of the location of the marriage or its exact date, marriage settlements often include genealogical information, such as the name of the bride's parents, or the name of trustees who might be family members. Primogeniture entails and marriage settlements combine with unpredictable lives, such as the death of a childless heir or all surviving children being daughters, that could have a significant and sometimes sudden effect on the prosperity of individual and families. The ups and downs of inheritance applied not only to the upper class, but also to the middle classes and some tradesmen and were relevant to businesses as well as land. Younger sons from upper-class families generally had to make their own way in life by entering professions such as the church, army or navy, but their prospects of advancement were often enhanced by family connection and marriage. 
entail and marriage settlements appear as themes in novels such as Pride and Prejudice. Mr. Bennett's land is entailed in a tale male. He has no sons, but five daughters. So when he dies, the land will automatically pass to a distant male relative, Mr. Collins. Mr. Bennett's lands bring him an income of £2,000 a year. But after his death, Mrs. Bennett's income will be reduced to £200 per year, derived from 4% interest on her £5,000 marriage settlement. However, that would still left, have left her in relative comfort, um, particularly compared to an agricultural labourer earning a tenth of that amount and with a large family to support. Now, for various reasons, the Society of Genealogists has accumulated all sorts of original deeds and documents, often including marriage settlements. These have come as parts of collections of family papers, research notes and miscellaneous documents donated over the years and often via the British Record Association, an, an institution that advises and liaises with solicitors when they come to clear deed boxes and papers, etc. This means that marriage settlements at the Society are scattered in various places. We've no uniform list of them all and they can be tricky to find, but that's not particularly unusual and I think reflects the situation of finding these documents outside the Society too. Mostly, we seem to have them dating from the 18th and early 19th century, but I've recently come across some in our collections, one dating from 1685 and possibly some from the reign of Charles I in 1635. And certainly you may find these documents going back to Tudor and medieval times. So, for example, here's a case study. The Register of Marriages solemnised in the parish of St George Hanover Square in 1820 show Thomas Brockenhurst Barclay Esquire of the marriage of Mickleham in the county of Surrey, a bachelor, and Sarah Peters of this parish, who were married by licence on the 12th of December 1820. The marriage allegation for the licence, issued on the 9th of December by the Bishop of London, shows Thomas Brockenhurst Barclay is a bachelor over 21 and intendeth to marry with Sarah Peters of St George Hanover Square, aged over 21, at St George Hanover Square, uh, which has been her usual place of abode um, in the space of the last four weeks past. Now we have a set of documents um, showing the transactions relating to this marriage and the family arrangements that were made in the days leading up to it. Most gentry marriages were accompanied by marriage settlements. No landed family wanted its daughters to marry without one, since to do so would leave her at the mercy of an unscrupulous groom or his family. The parties to a marriage settlement were the bride and groom, together with trustees representing both families. If the bride and groom were merely heirs to the property being conveyed, their parents or other benefactors would be named. If the settlement involved the purchase of property, then the previous owner of that property would also be named. Title deeds and other estate records are also vital, especially the family and marriage settlements by which gentle families provided for the descent of their estates. The marriage settlement was another important document in the process of inheritance. Sometimes it was a full settlement concerned not just with the marriage, but with the descent of the whole estate. The majority of marriage settlements, however, were focused solely on making provision for the bride. Many letters, diaries and other memoranda survive amongst family archives, recording the delicate and sometimes prolonged negotiations concerning marriage. The aim of the father of an eligible young bachelor was to negotiate an alliance with a family of equal or perhaps superior status who could provide a substantial dowry. Frequently, the bride selected was the widower. 30% of the widows in a sample of wills from the Prerogative Court of Canterbury between 1500 and 1588 had been married at least um, twice. If you're searching for gentry marriages and um, entries in parish registers, you may have to search far distance places, as we were looking at with the marriage indexes, for example, it could be easier to find a marriage settlement. On the other hand, gentry marriages were frequently given much greater prominence in parish registers than those of their inferiors, and often much more information may be available about marriages of people of this status. A marriage settlement commences with a recital of the fact that marriage is to take place, and sometimes the amount of dowry is to be paid. The fact that a dowry isn't mentioned doesn't necessarily mean that one wasn't paid. The property mentioned in, in a marriage settlement did not necessarily include the entire estate or inheritance of the groom. However, it was, in li it was likely to include all the bride's property. So here we have a settlement previous to the marriage of Thomas ba uh, Brocklehurst uh, Barclay Esquire and Miss Sarah Peters um, of 2000 pounds worth of consuls and five hundred five thousand pounds under agreement 
in law, everything the bride owned became her husband's property on marriage. The property in the settlement would be assigned to trustees for the joint use of husband and wife or the survivors of them and for their unborn children or in the absence of the latter to the right heirs. The property involved in a marriage settlement was not necessarily land. Sarah Peters bought £20,000 in consuls to her marriage with, with Thomas Brocklehurst Barclay in 1820, and her husband's life was to be insured for £5,000. A jointure of £600 was granted by Thomas Brocklehurst Barclay to Sarah Bur but Peters, his wife, and her trustees. A jointure was property granted to the wife for, a life, for, for life, the grant taking effect on the death of her husband. Under common law, all widows had the right to one third of their husband's lands as dower. However, a jointure provided by a marriage settlement provided greater certainty and more flexibility than the dower provided by common law. If a jointure was provided, then the right to dower lapsed. There's quite a few memorandas and extra notes within these deeds, including a memoranda of the original settlement showing how the consoles um, to that value of £20,000 was subsequently sold and the money was reinvested. And there's another memoranda within the deeds showing that the life insurance on her husband's life was paid up in 1866 when she received £9,000, um, uh, £875, I think that's what it was. So these marriage to settlement deeds comprise what we call at society the Barclay Special Collections. They've, they'd come to us um, either as a donation from family papers or through the British Record Association thinking this, that we might be interested in having them. And our collection paper list in this case has listed the names of the parties and trustees mentioned in all documents, indicating that they include the marriage settlement and various associated trust deeds. It sets out in the common convention used by archivists who are familiar with listings, um, the names in such documents, the main parties, A and B, so the bride and the groom, and then all the other parties mentioned in the documents who could be family members or other trustees. Here's another one that I've found in our document collection. Uh, I've noted on the back of the envelope um, the, uh, that it contains a marriage marriage settlement created on 16th of February 1775 regarding the monies of Anne Gladish of Stone next Dartford in Kent, um, how they were disposed on her marriage to Mr Richard Thompson of Ashurst Ridley in Kent. In this case again I've done a bit of background research to find that the marriage took place a week later or, or in, at Stone next Dartford and the accompanying record of the marriage licence issued at the Rochester Doros Registry which gives their ages as 26. Um, so you often find a, a, a sort of brief synopsis of what's inside the document, um, which is folded up. Normally there's a little pricey of what, what's there on the outside of the document, but eventually you should unfold it. And they can be quite tricky to read, um, as you can see, and uh, a little bit legalese, but hopefully, um, uh, there's some guidance on the outside about what, what it is and the main parties involved. Now, marriage settlements um, are not as rare as one would think. I did a uh, search for the term marriage settlements in the National Archives Discovery Catalogue and found there are over 44,000 entries relating to marriage settlements listed in the catalogue entries available from other archives that you can access through discovery. Um, so you're just searching on marriage settlements, a fair number. And of course you can search by name in discovery and that indicates that there's a lovely set of deeds and a marriage settlement relating to Richard Blindle, a yeoman of, of Datchworth in various estate records held at a Hertfordshire record office. So depending on how well the local archive has catalogued and listed these kind of documents will affect the success of your searches. Um, and you can find them listed in all sorts of catalogues, such as the London Metropolitan Archives. Again, I just did a search for marriage settlement and lots and lots and lots of references came up. Again, including here a marriage settlement for Samuel Wegg and Elizabeth Le Hook. Um, seem to be have various things having done for the settlement between 1743 to 1767. And it's, it's part of the Wegg family papers 
which had been lodged with the LMA. Similarly, you can find them listed in Herefordshire Archives catalogue, which is my area of interest, as shown here for um, Somerset Davis of Ludlow, a mercer, marrying um, Lucy, Isabel Lucy of Hereford. Um, they've catalogued here all, again all names of the parties involved in the same sort of in the same convention, the main parties and the others, and given a, a sort of brief synopsis of of, of, of uh, what one and two have agreed on, etc. Marriage settlements may be some of the documents lodged in the deeds registries, um, uh, such as here for the Dublin Registry of Deeds indexing project. I must say I haven't looked at the Middlesex Deeds Registry or the registries of three ridings of Yorkshire, but um, the, middle, the Dublin Deed Registry projects, again, you can search for marriage settlements as well as names. And they, here they will transcribe, as you can see, from the ver the, the, the the legalese, they are very wordy documents. Um, again, here's a transcript of the, of the deed relating to the marriage settlement here for the marriage of John Sibthorpe of Corkhill in the county, in the city of Dublin, a gentleman, and Mary Smallman, the daughter of Thomas Smallman of Rosecray in the county of Tipperary. And I think there are other people called Smallman um, who are either other members and transferring property uh, as part of this arrangement. Of course, with the vast number of deeds and documents contained in family muniment rooms that were auctioned as part of estate sales, etc., you will find that these records are incredibly dissipated and scattered. They're often brought up by antiquarian uh, and books, antiquarians and booksellers and document dealers, such as uh, James Coleman, who was an heraldic and genealogical bookseller and a uh, document dealer based in Bloomsbury. The Society of Genealogists has a large run of his sales catalogues from the end of the 19th and the early 20th centuries. Um, and we have created an index to the, the, to the names of the people mentioned in the uh, catalogue entries for the various documents. So here you can see he was, he was actually, um, there's an entry for M, a marriage settlement for Hannah Warger. We haven't yet added the scanned images of the catalogue to the online index, so you'd have to order them in from our catalogue to view the view the catalogues. But that would lead you to the entry here we got for entry item three one four, the marriage settlement relating to the marriage of Mr Henry Mercer Squire with Miss Hannah Warger of Brighton, uh, dated seventeen thirty seven. Um, I have no, there's no indication of who bought this particular document, if it was sold at all. It may, could have hopefully ended up in an archive somewhere, but equally so probably as a decorated lampshade or indeed even hanging on a pub wall somewhere. Another avid collector of deeds and documents was Frederick Arthur, Arthur Crisp. And in his printed volumes of records abstracting um, the documents he held in his collection, Fragmenta Genealogica volumes 11 and 13 abstract many of the, the marriage settlements he had in his possessions. We have these volumes at the SOG and they can be viewed on the fam via the Family Search um, catalogue as well. Um, here he, he gives some nice information about how he's abstracted a marriage settlement. He's made an abstraction of the records and then the names. Uh, the provisions and the uh, parties concerned, and drawn it up into little into a little family tree. Look, seeing for the you know the 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 useful genealogical information that you can glean from these documents. And sometimes they can get quite complicated. There'll be several other mem family members mentioned, and in quite a lot of the cases, he's gone on to establish when the marriage itself took place as well. In addition to the search pathways which lead you to the library catalogue and the Society of Genealogists digital collections, you can find other catalogues and lists, particularly from our archive collection, on the library pages of our websites, where you'll find what we call the collection guides. And one of the collection guides is to the archive collections. And this, um, are the, the listings for our document collection, topographical collections, roll pedigrees, and special collections. Um, 
So, for example, they'll give you the listing of the names in the thousands of role pedigrees um, that we hold. Um, we are publishing them online, but uh, there's many thousands still to go before that's complete. The document collection has thousands of boxes of miscellaneous manuscript research notes arranged in surname, and eventually you, you may find that you know there are settlement documents within those. We have the uh, there is a surname list in the archive collection of the names represented there, but the document collection list is just a surname list that you can find through the document collection archive um, lists to the document collection surname index, topographical collections, and the uh, the small and um, special collections from D to Z. A to D will be going onto a separate catalog very shortly. The special collections are usually the work of a genealogist looking at lots of families. And so they haven't been split up by surname. We've kept them to as an integrity. Um, within them, they do have uh, marriage settlements such as the Hughes Lloyd collection, uh, the work of the, uh, of the genealogist looking at the Hughes Lloyd family, uh, extracting within that are estate indentures, marriage settlements and, and other family property records, um, including a marriage settlement for Edward Lloyd and Dorothy Hughes, presumably the couple that, that formed you know, the, 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 the family that became the Hughes Lloyd family. And the Coulter Special Collection, again, uh, has manuscripts contain relating to the family property and rentals and estates and a draft marriage settlement for, for uh, a family member, Catherine Colshurst, to John Pine. The topographical collection that you can that you can look at um, is arranged county by county. Um, I can actually search search across those those PDFs of those topographical lists and pull out anything that was for, for marriage settlements. And I've identified within each of these uh, county lists that they have quite a lot of marriage settlements filed effectively by the parish rather than, the, rather than within the family papers or surname collections. So for example, for the Kent box, for the documents relating to Shoreham in 1768, this um, refers to, an, this has a marriage settlement that refers to three houses in uh, on the street in Shoreham, uh, 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 settled by Harry Goodyear of Horsham upon his wife Elizabeth Humphrey, his intended wife rather, and mentioning other family people mentioned in in the transfer of that property. But in this case, we've we've sort of filed it uh, in relation to the place rather than the, the names involved. Um, the document collection lists are just only tell you that there's something related to to the surname in a particular uh, envelope in the document collection of miscellaneous names arranged by surname. Um, it doesn't uh, specify as yet if, if those if those documents might be a settlement certificate, but there are several settlement certificates lodged in the uh, SOGs surname document collection of miscellaneous research notes, including a marriage settlement of Mr. Batson to Miss Smart of 1781. And again, I've identified the couple, found the marriage um, entry and the license. Um, and again, showing all sides of this story and marriage practice in the mid 18th century. If you want to read up on the legal side of marriage settlements, which I really have, uh, haven't looked at at all, then Lloyd Bonsfield's book, Marriage Settlement 1601 to 1740, where he uses a, um, about 300 uh, marriage settlement documents from Kent and, Ess and Northamptonshire as his um, basis of his doc doc doctoral study is incredibly detailed. But I think from the point of view of a genealogist, you might want to look at the books, uh, Tracing Your Georgian Ancestors and Your, uh, and your Aristocratic Ancestors by um, uh, Pen and Sword Books, or the Society of Genealogists' own My Ancestor Was a Gentleman. I think that it's commonly thought that these, these are the status of families that normally have marriage settlements. However, I think from we've seen that they certainly can come down to artisan and tradesman, merchant level. level. And so I think, 
probably not the documents you're looking for if you have pauper agricultural laborers, but if you have middle class artisans, it's worth looking around. Um, the only problem is you'll be looking in all sorts of places, both at the society and elsewhere. Um, I've run on a little bit, I think. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing there and uh, take some questions briefly towards the end.